Okay, um, we're ready to start now our second uh, lecture. Dr. Daniel Curio is the professor of internal medicine and he's the clinical director of the adult BMT program at the University of Michigan's Comprehensive Cancer Center in Ann Arbor. Dr. Curio has completed his residency training in Buenos Aires, Argentina, his Hemong Fellowship at Tufts University School of Medicine at St. Elizabeth Medical Center in Boston, and John Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Coriel is an expert in the area of GVHD. His clinical research has focused on risk factors, clinical presentations, and new treatment modalities for acute and chronic GVHD. He has been given numerous honors and has an extensive list of publications in the field of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Please welcome Dr. Coriel. So, hi everybody. Um, yes, I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina originally. I did have to repeat a residency here, by the way. Uh, that was hard. Um, so, how do I advance? Assistant needed? <laughs> so, in what? 920. Oh, okay. Double. Oh, okay. There you go. Excellent. Well, um, so my review today is going to be on graft versus host disease. Um, bear in mind that we only have 40 minutes, and I'm trying in these 40 minutes to, uh, to um, cover not only basic aspects of graft versus host disease, but also some of what I think are the, more, the most uh, many meaningful uh, advances in the field. I wanted to uh, thank uh, my group. Uh, a lot of these people are in this uh, meeting, uh, as well as the uh, pediatric BMT people that have contributed and continue to contribute to our program. Our research assistants, uh, very important because I know they're here, mid-level practitioners and nurses, our collaborators from other departments, and Sophie Pachesny, who uh, did extensive work in biomarkers and is now in Indiana. Uh, the topics that I'm going to try to cover uh, include acute and chronic graft versus host disease, um, and uh, I'm going to try to follow the same sort of structure for acute and chronic GVHD. And I'm going to start with acute, uh, the acute form of the disease and diagnosis. And I thought I'd impact you with a picture rather than going through uh, a lot of uh, descriptive uh, stuff. So the diagnosis of acute GVHD is usually, uh, um, you may have heard that it's really challenging, but it's, it's most of the time it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you do, if you had an allograft and you look like this, chances are that this is graft versus host disease. And between clinical manifestations and the biopsy uh, read jointly uh, uh, with uh, pathology and the clinician involved, uh, make a successful diagnosis <clears throat> most of the time. And uh, skin, GI tract, and liver are the three organs most frequently involved in acute graft versus host disease, less frequently the eye. Um, I'm gonna, so, so the rash uh, in the skin looks like this. Uh, it's maculopapular, is red. It can affect uh, pretty much any uh, any area in your skin, but typically uh, it also affects palms and soles. In this particular patient, um, who unfortunately died a few days after this picture was taken uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, she, she, this, she couldn't even walk or grab anything with her hands because of pain. Um, skin uh, is one organ. GI tract is another one. This is a biopsy of the GI tract which is uh, better than showing you diarrhea. Uh, which I, I, I know people that have done that. So um, as you can see here, uh, this biopsy shows uh, little circles here that are glands, uh, and these glands should normally be packed and 
uh, back to back, and here there are spaces between them. The reason for that is that they're vanishing, they're disappearing, and the reason that they're disappearing is that, um, and this is a big um, a, a focus on one of the glands, uh, that the cell, normal cells that are long and purple here are becoming apoptotic. Apoptosis, as you remember, is programmed cell death, uh, is, is a form of cell death. Uh, this is a, a, a dead uh, gland cell. Eventually, all of these will die and the gland will disappear. The same thing happens, and I'm not showing you this for the sake of time, in the liver where the targets are the biliary ducts in the portal spaces. So this biliary ducts will also undergo apoptosis and they will vanish. And, and, and actually this is the verb used by uh, the pathologist, right? The vanishing of the biliary ducts. Uh, fortunately, we do have prophylaxis. A prophylaxis is good, but it's not perfect. Uh, because we still have about 50, an incidence of 50% incidence of acute GVHD. So we still don't know the, uh, uh, what the optimal manipulation of the graft and or post-transplant immunosuppression uh, should be. Uh, and there are a number of, st uh, of, of strategies under study. I tried to list here the ones, the, at least the first uh, three bullet points, are the ones that are more frequently used as standard of care, uh, and that includes cyclosporine methotrexate, tacrolimus methotrexate. Those are the two most uh, standard forms. Um, sometimes, um, now uh, more and more frequently, the, the, the methotrexate component is changed to MMF uh, with success. Uh, as far as we know, and, and there, there's other emerging drugs like pentostatin uh, um, that uh, seems uh, promising according to a recent article in JCO uh, from uh, DeLima and collaborators uh, and uh, where that, that, sh that shows that uh, lower doses of pentostatin can act as uh, immunosuppressant and uh, preventive of acute graft versus host disease. Campath is also around. There's Campath lovers and haters, and uh, it's a, as, as you know, Campath is a T cell uh, depleting agent. And just as with Campath, there are lovers and haters of T cell depletion. Um, uh, T cell depletion definitely uh, prevents GVHD, but the argument against it is that it may have an increased rate of rejection, and more importantly, relapse. Is that fine balance between, you know, having uh, more or less GVHD versus more or less relapse that is very difficult to uh, achieve? Uh, and now I'm going to move on to a couple of more uh, innovative modalities, and you may have heard about this in presentations uh, in this meeting, and maybe Ash, if you were there, uh, this is uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Sang Choi and Pavan Reddy, who um, uh, tested histone deacetylase inhibitors as a form of prevention of acute GVHD. Uh, histone, uh, the histones are, uh, you may or may not remember, but they're proteins uh, that uh, associate uh, DNA. Um, or are associated with DNA. Acetylation of these proteins causes a uh, change in, in uh, the, the structure of, of the DNA leading to changes in gene expression. Um, and uh, inhibition of this acetylation with histone deacetylase inhibitors, which I'm going to call HDAC inhibitors for short, uh, for short uh, has been shown by Pavan Reddy and his lab to inhibit acute GVHD in the mouse. And this was translated uh, to a patient uh, clinical trial with patients, and I think is one of the most uh, uh, wonderful um, examples of translation uh, from uh, bench to bedside. Uh, the study schema was such that patients received a reduced intensity regimen that's uh, relatively standard for us, FluBU2, um, and uh, Tacrolimus MMF was the preventive strategy and Vorinostat was added at 100 milligrams POBID from day minus 10 
to day 100. Um, with this schema, we measured uh, day 100 grade 2 to 4 IQ GVHD as primary endpoint. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with patient characteristics, and we don't have time for that, but look at the um, uh, I'm comparing here in this slide um, control patients that are historical and uh, are University of Michigan patients with our study patients. Um, w there were 47 uh, study patients. Uh, the difference is here, uh, the main difference is the age. They're older in the study group, okay? The rest of the um, characteristics are pretty much matched. Um, acute uh, GVHD. Um, was the primary endpoint. As you can see, uh, there's significantly less acute GVHD in the study group versus the control group. Uh, there's also a difference in grade three to four acute GVHD, and, uh, but actually it didn't reach uh, uh, significance. Uh, the numbers were small, as you can uh, see here. Um, let me focus on this part of the, um, of the table. So look at the day 180, grade 2 to 4, acute GVHD in controls, 56%, that's pretty standard, 24% uh, in the study group. Uh, day 180, grade 3 to 4, 20%, this may be a little higher than you may have seen in the control group versus 6%, looks good. Even if without looking at the control group, it looks good um, for uh, the study group. Uh, you, you have secondary endpoints here if you're wondering about transplant-related mortality, relapse, disease-free survival, overall survival, and infections. And they're all uh, very acceptable or even lower. As you can see, 4% transplant-related mortality is low. Uh, relapse, 17%, is on the low side for what, what we're uh, used to seeing. So, uh, and, 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 a, and a nice overall survival. This, this was used through a variety of different diseases. In conclusion, uh, the administration of orinostat beginning day minus 10 through day 100 after match-related donor-reduced intensity transplant was safe and feasible. Uh, Vorinostat combined with a standard GVHD prophylaxis reduced rate 2 to 4 IQ GVHD significantly. I have not shown you this, but uh, they also elegantly showed that there was enhanced uh, acetylation of histones, reduced uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-6 that you may remember were associ are associated with acute GVHD, and also increased regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells are a compartment of the immune system that are associated with immune tolerance. And as you know, immune tolerance is the cure for things like graft versus host disease. Uh, and it was a very nice example of translation uh, from uh, bench to bedside. Uh, so uh, with this, I want to make sure that you just don't go back and start using Vorinostat. This is still uh, being studied. Uh, actually, uh, there's uh, an ongoing study that is targeting unrelated donor transplants. This was done, as I said, in match-related donors. Um, the other uh, strategy that we've tested, it, this, is a lot, this is a lot more preliminary than the other data that I showed you, is extracorporeal photophoresis for prevention of acute GVHD. So um, it, the, the rationale is that, uh, the reality is that we still don't know how photophoresis works, but, uh, but you know, uh, some studies have shown that there may be an incre they may be an increased number of Tregs, uh, therefore inducing immune tolerance uh, after treatment of um, of chronic GVHD and another uh, relatively small study in scleroderma. Uh, so why not try it uh, as, a, as a preventive strategy? So uh, this is a courtesy of Dr. Levine, uh, who gave me this in the uh, in next uh, slide. Uh, and in this study, ECP, extracorporeal photophoresis, was combined with etanercept. Etanercept has been used before this study on its own uh, in a single institution study that showed advantage. So the hope was that, you know, to, find, to try to find synergy between these two. Regulatory T cells were also measured to see if they were increased with the extracorporeal photophoresis treatment. And as you can see, extracorporeal photophoresis was offered uh, from day zero to day 56. 
uh, and TACRO MMF was the sort of uh, baseline uh, uh, regimen um, used. So there were 44 valuable patients. Um, GBHD developed uh, before day 28 in 10, that is when they started ECP, uh, and failures occurred in uh, 20, and this is how we define failure, death uh, from uh, any cause, relapse, or steroid use for acute GVHD. So the success rate preliminarily is 55%. As I said, we need uh, uh, more follow-up, and there's been uh, this number of late deaths uh, that is after day 180, but the follow-up is not complete. This uh, study has uh, closed not long ago. Um, so here you have uh, the overall survivals at one year and two years, 73% uh, and 52% respectively. Uh, and uh, this data suggests that we can do it. I mean, it's, it's, there is enough feasibility data if you want. Um, we have not, we, I don't have the data to show you uh, as far as what happens with regulatory T cells. That's uh, to come. Uh, there's more to come. Uh, and <clears throat> and uh, like I said, I think that it's going to be very important to look at the long-term data and how this correlates, uh, if it does, with an increase of regulatory T cells. But I think that um, I think that what we need to do, or where we need to focus, is to try to find uh, biomarkers that uh, reliably uh, tell, allow us to prognosticate and to uh, risk uh, stratify. And I'm going to quickly, uh, not, I'm going to go into the detail, I'm going to show you what the references are so you can look them up. And I'm going to tell you about the two biomarkers that I think are more interesting as far as acute GVHD. One of them is plasma concentration, is, is sorry, uh, suppressor of tumorigenicity 2, ST2 which is the IL-33 receptor, uh, and this was um, studied by uh, Pachesny's group at the University of Michigan, uh, and actually she showed that uh, ST2 concentrations correlate with the day 28 response and uh, day 180 non-relapse mortality uh, in acute GVHD. Uh, and as you can see here, if you look at the four, three, four, fifth line, SD2 alone has an odds ratio for the prediction of day 28 response to therapy of three, uh, which is significant. Um, and when you look at the risk stratification, I'm going to uh, take you to this line, uh, high SD2 and high grade of uh, GVHD together predict a day 180, 64% uh, non-relapse mortality. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is compared with the, with the other different uh, risk uh, strata. So this is an interesting biomarker, and there's more being done uh, on it. Uh, the second and last biomarker that I think uh, shows promise uh, has been uh, pioneered by Dr. Ferrara's lab, uh, and it's REC3-alpha. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to focus on the first couple of panels, because as I said, time is of essence. Um, and uh, REC3-alpha here correlates uh, with response to uh, therapy, again, in acute GVHD, and non-relapse mortality. So if you have, uh, so people who don't respond have a uh, high REC3-alpha level to begin with, and people who have a higher mortality have a higher level of rec 3 Alpha and Reg 3 Alpha. I know that this is difficult to read. This is impossible to read because I can barely read it from here. But I'm going to try to guide you through it. But Reg 3 Alpha comes from the panacels in the GI uh, uh, tract wall, uh, and and this is why it's particularly interesting for uh, GI GVHD. And you can see here how the levels in GI GVHD compared to non-GVHD inflammation of the gut is very significantly uh, elevated. So it has value, of course, as a diagnostic tool in cases where uh, GI-GVHD is not clear enough. Uh, there are also differences between liver with GVHD and liver without GVHD, and the differences are not so pronounced in the skin. So very interesting GI tract biomarker. 
And so basically those are the, uh, in my opinion, more meaningful advances from a clinical perspective uh, for prevention and prediction of acute GVHD. As I, I summarize the treatment in one slide. It's, that's pretty bad, right? That, that means that we haven't made a lot of uh, progress over time. But, and you can tell that I'm, I'm still using uh, references from Paul Martin from 1990 and 1991. Uh, pretty frustrating, but basically uh, still first-line steroids, f about 40-50% uh, response rate. When you don't respond to steroids, you're in trouble. That means you have steroid refractory acute GVHD, and second-line ATG has an overall response rate of 40%, and that does not guarantee you long-term survival, okay? Uh, in addition to ATG, a lot of different other modalities have been explored through the years. I don't think that any of these is a home round. I think that uh, probably Grynix has shown a better results as far as response rate and survivals with extracorporeal photophoresis. But overall, uh, it is a very bad situation that we really need to avoid. Um, survival related to grade and response, uh, to, survival is related to grade and response to therapy. Uh, with more than 50% mortality after frontline therapy. And second, when you need second-line therapy, you have steroid-resistant GVHD. You have very bad outcome with as low as 10% long-term survival, even with a 40% initial response rate. So with this, I think that I've reviewed what I wanted to review in acute GVHD, and we have... Uh, some time for chronic GVHD. I think I'm halfway through, right? Good. Um, so chronic GVHD, we go from alloimmunity, that is donor T cells um, uh, attacking the host, to probably autoimmunity, or maybe the difference is semantic, because at some point you have to take possession of your graft, right? Um, and, and normally chronic GVHD occurs after day 100, but... Uh, but also, acute GVHD can happen after day 100. So, so this uh, chronologic definition is pretty arbitrary, and, and we're, we've done away, I think, with it. It is very polymorphic. That means that, you know, it presents uh, uh, in different ways with different manifestations. It mimics different autoimmune diseases, but the differences are just as many as the similarities. It can affect almost any organ. But skin, mucosa, conjunctiva, and immunosuppression are, uh, immune system, are the most uh, frequently affected. Um, the NIH consensus group, uh, I think, did, uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, did a lot for chronic GVHD. It, for the, you know, I think that for, for starters, it, it, it turned our, it, it turned everyone's attention into the disease. Um, it, turned the definition into a clinical definition rather than, oh, you have chronic GVHD after, if, after day 100. There's nothing magical about day 100. Uh, and it divided clinical manifestations into diagnostic, distinctive, common overlap, or others. I'm going to focus on the diagnostic manifestations. These are those manifestations that when you see the patient come into your clinic, uh, it, you just don't need anything but to look at the patient to make the diagnosis, okay? They come with this big sign, I have chronic GVHD. So uh, distinctive uh, are the manifestations that require further testing or an additional organ. And you know that there are people that have both acute and chronic GVHD at the same time, and, and this, uh, these definitions uh, account for that. Uh, and then there are rather con other controversial manifestations. This table shows you uh, the, the different uh, uh, categories of GVHD according to this new um, NIH consensus definition. So you have classic acute, persistent, or late acute. Uh, and, and these uh, two are clinically the same, but they differ as far as uh, timing. Uh, they both have acute features and no chronic features. Uh, overlap can happen any time post-transplant, and it has both acute features and chronic features. And we've seen the acute features. Now I'm going to show you the chronic features, right? And chronic, classic chronic is chronic with nothing but chronic GVHD features. Um, oh, something happened to this line. Okay, there's no reason why this is green, just FYI. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that I'm trying to point out the skin, but... Um, 
But basically, um, th there's a lot of words here that are uh, long and, um, and confusing, but um, what, what has color is diagnostic, basically, okay, either green or yellow. So in the skin, uh, you normally in the clinic, you'll, and I'll show you this, uh, you'll see two big phenotypes. One is the lichenoid one, the red rash one, and the other one is the sclerotic one, which is, you know, the one where, you know, people are producing scar tissue uh, under the skin uh, mainly. Uh, and I think that every chronic GVHD has some degree of fibrosis uh, or fibrogenesis. Uh, because if you don't have the scar tissue under the skin, you're going to have it in your lacrimal glands or your salivary glands causing dry eye and dry mouth, which, which is usually associated to the lichen planus or lichenoid forms of the disease. So, um, so, so fibrogenesis, so, so you could consider, um, from that perspective, uh, chronic GVHD a, a fibrogenetic, uh, disease, right? Uh, a, a scar tissue forming disease. Uh, in the mouth, you have lichenoid changes that I'm going to show you. When females have mouth GVHD, they usually have vaginal GVHD. And it's very important to know this because they usually, usually patients don't volunteer this, okay? So when you see mouth GVHD in a female, ask about uh, vaginal symptoms like dryness or other, uh, uh, or dyspareunia, other things that may be associated with vaginal GVHD. Esophageal web uh, and strictures, uh, biopsy proven bronchiolitis obliterans, and actually this criteria have been designed for clinical trials. Uh, with this, I'm not saying that you need a biopsy in every patient to confirm BO, bronchiolitis obliterans, clinically, okay? Uh, you can do it without the biopsy. And then fasciitis and strictures at the musculoskeletal level. I'm going to go to global scoring, um, and I'm, I'm, I dropped uh, the organ-specific scoring. But um, it, it's boring, and you're going to forget it, and you can read it. So um, basically, the global scoring has uh, three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. And the severity in the NIH consensus classification is based on number of organs involved, severity of organs involved, and each organ has a severity uh, a criteria, and the existence of lung GVHD, which bumps you up to a more severe level of GVH. So as you've seen, all of these manifestations that we use to uh, grade, to score GVHD, are late. Uh, you, let, me not, let, me not, let me go to diagnose GVHD. So the manifestations that we use to diagnose GVHD, they're pretty late. In the, I mean, when you have GI strictures uh, or you have, you know, sclerosis everywhere uh, uh, and you diagnose GVHD at that point, it's already late. Uh, uh, because your manifestations are largely irreversible. I'm not saying that, that fibrosis is completely irreversible, largely irreversible. So, and the reason for this is that the clinical manifestations of GVHD that may be red flags or maybe preceding uh, uh, the, the more severe advanced manifestations are very nonspecific. Uh, like pruritus without a rash, you've probably heard this from patients, or uh, a dr very dry uh, uh, skin, or atypical localized rashes that precede, you know, a full-blown lichenoid uh, phenotype, or progressive joint stiffness, uh, and, and we can go on and on, or, or new oral dryness discomfort, uh, or conjunctival erythema, itchy eyes, uh, etc. So. These manifestations can go on to a more severe form of chronic GVG or can stay there. So nobody's going to, you know, uh, uh, pull the trigger and start one meg per kilo of prednisone in people with, you know, such nonspecific manifestations. So normally we only start treatment when things cannot be improved in a major way, and this is why our results are not that great. 
uh, and I'm not saying that we're doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that, you know, we need ways to predict what's going to happen uh, or to even uh, diagnose things a little earlier uh, that we don't have. So here you have the two big uh, skin phenotypes of G chronic GVHD. Uh, these are um, polygonal and, uh, well, they're papule, maculopapules with different shapes, pearl colored, um, and uh, they're, they're almost identical to uh, lichen planus, and that's a lichen planus like or lichenoid form. And here uh, you have the more uh, dramatic uh, sclerotic form where, uh, you know, fibrous tissue has accumulated around most uh, joints in this person, and she can uh, barely move. Uh, some people have a combination of both, uh, and this is a pretty dramatic case of, you know, uh, the lichen planus like lesions that I told you that sometimes merge into something that's called lichen sclerosis. And you can, well, yeah, you can see that there's uh, stiffening of the skin here, and that's because there's also sclerosis, okay? Uh, these are situations that are very difficult to improve. So I've shown you some lichenoid uh, and... Uh, a colored rash uh, uh, forms. Uh, here I'm going to show you uh, bad, severe cases of uh, sclerotic chronic GVHD. This is a, a pipe stem, a stem situation, a leg of a patient with uh, a, a, a basic sclerosis of every layer of the skin. Uh, and here, uh, severe dermal sclerosis with a lot of bullous uh, lesions. And this was a benign angioma that had really nothing. And the uh, last diagnostic manifestations in, in the NIH consensus is uh, uh, poikiloderma. Uh, poikiloderma, uh, uh, it, it means sort of, uh, it comes from uh, elephant-like skin. Uh, and it's thinning of the skin, discoloration, and hemangiomas that you can actually see here and there. Um, that is uh, not necessarily a very active manifestation. That may be just uh, one of those uh, inactive sequelar uh, manifestations. Uh, with scleroderma, a lot of patients develop scarring, uh, again, fibrosis, alopecia. Uh, a lot of patients uh, lose their nails. Um, and now we move from the skin to the mouth. Uh, as I told you, the lichenoid phenotype was typical, uh, was one of the major manifestations of skin GVHD. And lichen, lichen, lichen planus, lichenoid manifestations can happen on the lips. It can happen along with uh, erosions, as you can see, in the mouth, uh, in the tongue. Uh, and actually, uh, this is uh, not uh, chronic GVHD alone. This is actually long-standing chronic GVHD in a person that developed uh, papilloma virus infection, and this is a squamous cell carcinoma. This poor lady um, had a uh, glossectomy with lymphadenectomy, and she died of her uh, tongue cancer. Uh, but uh, this goes along with uh, what a lot, uh, some people have shown, uh, the relationship between chronic inflammation, such as in the case of chronic GVHD, and the development of cancer. Uh, secondary cancer. So should we target uh, chronic GVHD earlier? Since we know that there is a process that goes from inflammation to fibrosis, we probably should anticipate this stage. So establish and late uh, chronic GVHD, I called it. Um, and this is, this is the point where we make the diagnosis according to NIH consensus. But how, how can we manage to predict what happens at an earlier stage, because this is where you can make a difference. Once you get to the point that I've shown you in the pictures, I don't think you can do that much. Uh, I invite you to see two of our, uh, uh, actually this is tonight, I think, both of them, uh, two of our uh, preliminary results on uh, some biomarkers that may help predict uh, chronic GVHD uh, manifestations, and actually outcomes as well. Uh, and we did look at ex extracellular matrix uh, turnover uh, biomarkers. Uh, and, and the reason why we focused on extracellular matrix is because we think it's relevant in all forms of chronic, pretty much all forms of chronic GVHD. 
uh, and, and we talked about fibrogenesis, and that is the reason why I'm making this uh, statement. Um, so these are the two related uh, abstracts that we submitted that you can uh, take a look at today in the tonight in the poster session. We don't have time for me to explain this to you. I want to go to uh, first-line therapy for chronic GVHD. It's still prednisone. Um, this study has shown no difference between prednisone and prednisone as a plus cyclosporin. But bear in mind that although there is no difference in the possibility of secondary treatment using a calcineurin inhibitor like tacrolimus or cyclosporin, uh, decreases the, um, the incidence of a steroid, long-term steroid-related complications. In this particular study, the incidence of avascular necrosis was lower when you used uh, um, cyclosporin. So I think, yes, I have t 10 seconds. Oh, I can't read. I'm sorry. Oh, minutes. Okay. So actually, I can go to this. So the, I can go to the, my, I can follow my, we're, we're about to finish actually. So the overall um, uh, responses to the steroids are about 50%. So it's all 50%. It's easy to remember. You can look good with uh, the patients relatively easily. But look at this, over two to three years, okay? So that means that P, these people are this long on therapy. And actually Stewart in 2004 published uh, something that, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting and dramatic, which is that the median duration of immunosuppression is 23 months for, for these people, and 15% of the patients will still be on immunosuppression seven years after you started them. So, uh, pretty, uh, so, so, so these are, this is probably one of the things that patients complain have not heard before having their transplant, okay? I'm not sure that they would have, it would have changed their minds, but I think it's, it's important to include it in our uh, initial explanation to them. Uh, people with steroid refractory chronic GVHD have a higher mortality. They don't all die like with acute GVHD. Um, and, and more importantly, I think, is that they, they, could, they, they tend to live miserably, okay? Morbidity is a big deal in chronic GVHD. So uh, with a chronic GVHD, it's a little more difficult to define um, steroid refractory, you know, the point at which people stop responding to steroids. Uh, so I think that in general, and I think that we need to define it at least for our own groups um, to have consistency in what we do, but basically I think the three components are uh, response to steroids defined as worsening or disease that doesn't move stability, or the inability to taper that some people call dependence or intolerance, which are people that for, because of bad diabetes or other reasons or because they go crazy, you can't give them steroids. Uh, the time that you administer the steroids and, uh, and, and, and actually a definition of adequate therapy, meaning that they've gotten enough of the treatment. So these three components should be part of any steroid refractory chronic GVHD definition uh, that we use, okay? There is not one official one, but I, I decided to list the components that you should require. Second line treatment, just like with first line treatment, people need to be accrued into a clinical trial. Uh, the responses are, again, 50%. The majority of the responses to second line are partial and over a long period of time. Uh, you know, this is, again, emphasizing the fact that we start treatment pretty late because we diagnose the disease pretty late. Uh, and one of the important objectives of the second-line therapy is not only to get the chronic GVHD out of, uh, under control, but it's to spare steroids. Because, as you know, over time, manifestations of steroid toxicity blend into the syndrome of chronic GVHD. Uh, also, uh, steroids, uh, the more steroids that you get, and these are different levels of steroids, the higher your non-relapse mortality. So, um, so, you know, this is why uh, chronic GVHD is very uh, complex, because uh, the more uh, severe or the more established it is, uh, the more um, that you have 
uh, long-term steroid toxicity uh, being part of uh, the, the syndrome and complicating uh, the picture. Uh, this is a work done by a uh, European uh, group uh, published in BBMT recently that shows uh, the, the treatment options uh, that are more frequently used as second line. Um, and as you can see, uh, an increase in steroids and photophoresis are the two most frequently uh, used uh, uh, strategies. You have a list of, look at all the things that you, you could be using, but uh, these are the two that I use uh, most frequently. Don't forget supportive care because this is a central component in the management of these patients and very often neglected, okay? People usually don't die of very complicated things. Um, and you don't want a patient to die of PCP because we forgot to put him on Bactrim. So the, these are the things that are unforgivable, okay? Uh, so um, here, uh, the objectives of, of, of uh, ancillary care, supportive ancillary care are education and prevention. If someone's going to the beach, uh, use sunscreen because that can, you know, flare GVHD. Uh, prevention of infection. Don't forget that these people need to be on anti uh, everything. Um, also, you know, making the patient, make the patient feel better. I mean, you know, if they have a dry mouth, give them, uh, you know, mouthwashes or uh, mouth sprays or artificial saliva, whatever the preference of the patient is. Provide psychosocial uh, and, and, and sexual uh, support. Um, this is very, very important. Um, more important than we give it uh, credit to most of these people are depressed and that needs to be addressed just as much as their skin, okay? Uh, and then address therapy-related complications. Don't forget to look at what's going on in a hip that hurts, okay? So uh, this is all of essence and we usually get so caught up in the immunosuppression that so there's a lot of work to be done in chronic GVHD. It's a very open area, um, and, uh, and I always encourage uh, younger uh, investigators and transplanters to consider it as, as a, an area of research focus. Uh, and, and actually, the different uh, sections or areas that you can focus are early diagnosis and biomarkers, scoring and response to therapy, um, and prevention and treatment with novel, novel targets and agents, and very, very importantly, uh, mechanism of disease. That's going to help us use all these strategies uh, better. And finally, I wanted to thank all my patients that through the last uh, 20 uh, or so years have helped me um, with my career and, and, you know, more importantly, have helped me learn how to help other patients. Uh, and thank you for listening to the presentation. Questions? Thanks for the lecture. Um, I'm Lucchini from Frankfurt, Germany. Um, I have a bit of a philosophical question. When you, when you read papers about chronic GVHD treatment, very often it is claimed that patients had a very late response to treatment, like ages after treatment. As you well said, um, patients remain on treatment for years, and at a certain point they respond. The, the question is, do they really respond to the treatment at that time, or they enter tolerance? So do, can we really affect the patient by giving for two years' time or three years' time an immunosuppressive treatment which will be tailored and maybe tapered every now and then because of complication, because of other problems? And all of a sudden, when we see a, a better clinical outcome, then can we still say it was that treatment that was so prolonged as to affect him? No, you, that's an excellent question. So what, you're, what she's asking is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is in patients that you've treated for a long period of time, where you, when you finally see a response to therapy, uh, can you attribute that response to exactly. the medications or the regimen they are giving the patient? And the answer is not really. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and the reason for this 
is that at some point, and this is what we tell our patients, I think, you know, things, chronic GVG burns out. Uh, at some point, tolerance happens. So uh, did we expedite that process with the treatment or that treatment happened because it was meant to happen because we don't understand the pathophysiology of how or when it happens? And that's a question that's unanswered. What's more, I want to complete this briefly by telling you that there's a lot of ancillary uh, measures that we use that can influence your response. So for example, I'll give you an example. I had a kid that um, had chronic GVHD in his uh, wrists and could not, uh, uh, pretty bad, could not stretch them. So I started him on steroids and saw him a couple of months later. One hand had improved dramatically. The other one was just as bad. Um, and that, that doesn't happen. Usually the clinical improvement is symmetric. So I started talking to him, and what he told me is that he worked as a waiter. So the right hand uh, was constantly being uh, exercised with, you know, stretching. So the, that, that tells you about the, imp the importance of the contribution of physical therapy. So what was steroids? How much was steroids? How much was physical therapy, quote-unquote, uh, uh, we don't know. So we have to be very careful when we assess response to therapy. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm Jennifer, I'm a nurse practitioner from Canada. And um, I guess the one question I would have for you would be about sort of the holy grail, as they say. Are we going to get there with respect to having an opportunity to promote graft versus leukemia effect, but eventually be able to get rid of graft versus host. There's been a number of abstracts presented that suggest that many mice have given their lives in the quest for this. And that there was a, a very good paper that was presented on memory cells and other things. You think we're going to get to a therapy where I, we might be able to prevent it altogether but maintain the immu immunological effect? I think we are. I think that because we are in a we all are in a transition uh, phase and a transition phase of growth, we fail to see how much we've done over the last 20 or more years. Um, I think that there's a lot more knowledge as far as some of the basic mechanisms underlying chronic GVHD than there was 20 years ago, 15 years ago, without a doubt. These, this knowledge is not yet quite yet translating into therapeutic differences. Uh, but I think that over time, everything will come together, and I'm an optimistic uh, optimist, but uh, uh, everything will come together and we'll see a difference. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I, you guys, I'm, I keep answering until you say stop. <laughs> Just two more. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm Yushim from Cincinnati. I'm an immunology fellow. Um, so my question is that when, whether you would consider either T-cell infusion for the patients that have um, resistant GVHD, not very late, if you catch them sometime in the middle, so would you consider the T-cell infusion, one question, and the second question is that whether you would ever consider Retransplant re them. Sorry, would you mind coming here because I, can, I, I can't hear you. To this. Um, that one? Because uh, I, somehow this, th I can hear this one, but I can't sure. hear you. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, if you can repeat that. So the first question T cell infusion. Yes. Peripheral T cell infusion. Would you consider? Or would you recommend it? Is For it? what? For um, chronic GVHD. No. no. T-cell infusions? Mm -hmm. No. It's no. a hypothetical question. I'm an immunology fellow. I don't know. No, so do you know, that's but fine. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a valid question. No, as a matter of fact, T-cell infusions are usually uh, contraindicated when you have active GVHD. So, no. But if you, if you isolate the CD... 25 positive cells. Oh, you mean yeah. T-reg infusion. Yeah. T-reg well, infusion. That, that, that this is could, what I meant. That could work out. We think that that is the mechanism mm -hmm. of uh, immune tolerance, but, um, but, but that still needs to be confirmed, too. 
okay? But people are looking into that. And, and I can't tell you, you know, yet whether it's the right thing to do or not. Thanks. But thank you for the question. That's an excellent question. My question is, do you have advice on when to start therapy for people with lo who may have mild chronic GVH but for several months and their quality of life isn't drastically impacted but you see them visit after visit and you think, or we say amongst ourselves, they're still doing everything they want to be doing and, you know, maybe we should just wait but then for Lyme Sometimes GVHC. it seems we're waiting lengthy periods of time. I'm just curious if there's any advice or consensus on when to start. So uh, for bronchiolitis obliterans. No, I mean just for chronic GVH. Oh, chronic GVH. In general. So, you know, the NIH consensus uh, recommends that you treat moderate or severe cases. Um, and I recommend that... Uh, I know what you mean because a lot of people tend to wait. I tend to treat when I have to treat. So um, basically manifestations of chronic GVHD that impact the patient in any way uh, have to be treated. Uh, and actually waiting is a double-edged sword because I don't think that in the long run you're going to do the patient any favor as far as steroid sparing. The steroids you're not using today, you will have to use uh, uh, tomorrow, plus probably more. So uh, I think that, you know, needs to be treated when, when it needs to be treated. So uh, as a general rule, moderate to severe cases should be treated. Now, as manifestations like, for example, fibrotic manifest, so a dry eye, you know, that goes nowhere. Uh, should, you, should you continue to treat a dry eye? We said, well, the answer is probably no, you know. So, the, so there's something that we, had, we don't talk about in chronic GVG, which is active versus inactive manifestations. Active manifestations are manifestations that have an inflammatory component that changes over time, you know. Uh, and, and inactive manifestations are the, you know, usually fibrotic, you know, fibro mediated by, through by fibrosis. So, it, you know, where there's scar tissue and no movement, you know, you're probably going to make very little difference with, with treatment and you focus more on supportive care. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.